Father in heaven, we have such an incredibly rich privilege to sing these lyrics to you this morning as your church. We live in a world of, of those who do not know you and they do not know your forgiveness. They don't know what peace with you looks like. And we know you. We enjoy life with you. You have called us. You have convicted us. You have shown us our helpless, miserable estate apart from your son. And you've breathed life into us so that we would even believe your gospel. And Lord, we, we worship you because these realities are are not just fact, but they're true in us subjectively. And so our, our desire, Lord, is that we would live such lives before you to please you. And that as a result, even here in this, in this life, in this world, that we would testify to the power of the gospel and the power of Christ in our own lives. And so, Lord, as we, as we direct our attention to your word as your church, I just want to pray corporately for all of us, that all of us who are your children, all of us who are, belong to your son, Jesus Christ, I pray that we would live such lives so full of supernatural peace in a, in a world that does not know it, that we would live lives free from fear in a world that's consumed by it, and that through this church, many would see a true and saving faith. And Lord, I pray that through our lives, through the actual conduct of faithful living and display of peace with you and clear articulation of your gospel, pray that through our discipleship, Lord, you would bring many to know you. And so as we direct our attention to your word this morning, Lord, I do pray that this would equip us, that it would help us, uh, that we might live more sanctified as a result, and that you might use us accordingly. Lord, we want to be useful to you. So please answer this prayer as we direct our attention to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, you can go ahead and take a seat. And um, I want to ask you to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 5. We're in Mark chapter 5. For the massive majority of you, that's no surprise. Um, if you're new to G GBC, this church is devoted to God's word, and it's, we, we just have an, a bottomless um, resource in the scripture. It is absolutely infinite and unlimited in the glory contained in the scriptures. And so, as we direct our attention back to the book of Mark, I thought about it this morning as I was singing there on the front row, I, I thought, you know, it, it might be worth mentioning something that we all can often take for granted. This morning, we're going to study God's Word. We get to crack open the Bible. This is the very Word of God. It's the very expression of God. God, the maker of heaven and earth, has spoken, and He has written it down so that it is absolutely knowable, verifiable, outside of us, and we can trust it. And so this morning, we get to look at a story from the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as we look at this story, what you're going to hear, every last detail is true. It is fact. And what's also really thrilling about reminding us of the obvious before we preach and study God's Word it's not enough to know that this story happened. It's not enough to even know how the story happened. We need to understand the implications of this story so that we know the impact it ought to have on our lives. To do that this morning, we're going to um, we're have, a, have our hands full. This is a story within a story. And so Mark is very fond of doing a story within a story. It's, uh, he starts a story, he does another story, and then he finishes the first story. And so it's kind of a, it's called a Markin sandwich, if you will. And we get to eat a Markin sandwich this morning. And so as, as we read Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43, you'll notice that there's two stories. A story of a daughter and a story of a woman. The story of the daughter goes from verses 21 to 24, and, this, and then it picks it back up in verse 35 to 43. 
And the story of the older woman goes from verses 25 all the way through 34, right in the middle of that story. So let's start, and we're going to read this story from Mark. And then I'm going to give us a, a kind of an introduction on how to pay attention to this story within a story so we come to the right conclusion, the conclusion that Mark wants us to have as we understand and study the story that he's told us. Follow along as I read Mark, 20, Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him, except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, Little girl, I say to you, Get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately, they were completely astonished, astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. This is a pretty profound story within a story. Mark is very fond of this, as I've mentioned, and we've already seen one notable example of this. If you want to turn back in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3, I want to remind you of the, one of the most notable comes in verses 20 to 35. And if you remember, this story starts with the, the story of the hometown crowd. It's the story of Jesus's family and friends. It's those who knew him best, who knew him well. It's the Nazareth crowd. Uh, in verses 20 and 21, he came home and the crowd was gathered up again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. And when his own people heard about this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he's lost his senses. The story picks back up in verse 31 with his immediate family. Then his mother and his brothers arrived and standing outside, they sent word to Jesus and, and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, behold, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, who are my mother and my brothers? 
looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And if you remember, this story uh, contains another story inside of it. It's another Mark and Sandwich, if you will. Verses 22 to 30 is the story of the religious leaders from Jerusalem. And as Mark tells this story, the entire story from verse 22 to 30 is in a, a verb tense that makes it very clear to the Greek reader of the story that this is really just giving you background to understand the real story, which is on the outside of uh, the family. And what's interesting about this story within a story is it's clearly intended to make a comparison. Most of Mark's stories within a story are intended to make a comparison. And so when you see a story within a story, it's important to pay attention to comparison by way of parallel and by way of contrast. In this particular example, back in chapter 3, we saw that both stories are similar in that both stories are examples of unbelief. The family, the hometown crowd from Nazareth, they were looking at Jesus and they are imagining they're loyal to Christ. He's our guy. He's the hometown guy. I mean, these are claim to fame and the family, his brothers and his mom are like looking at how much publicity he's getting concerned that it's not going to go well for him to take on the establishment. Then in the story of the establishment, they are also unbelieving, but Mark has already documented the unbelief of the religious leaders. He does that in clear and no uncertain terms from chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 6. So now, when he's already proven that and he's moved on to document the unbelief of the nation, what is this story doing here? It's told in an offhanded way to create a foil or a contrast to the family from Nazareth. And so if you imagine, if you imagine that a religious, loyal allegiance to Christ that falls short of obeying God's will is somehow better than an agnostic or an atheist who thumbs his nose at God and shakes his fist at his sovereignty, you are mistaken. Neither one is better than the other. They are both just different forms of unbelief. And the contrast has this powerful effect to show us that lesson. We could look at other examples. We'll see them coming up in chapter 6. And I'll just mention this by by way of just another comparison. Later in in Mark chapter 6, we're going to see a story within a story about the disciples and John the Baptist. Jesus sends out the disciples to go preach a gospel of repentance. And skips 20 verses later and tells them that they come back from their ministry. And they're bragging about how much power and authority they had over demons. Inside that story about the the disciples' ministry of preaching repentance, you have the story of John the Baptist in prison. And here's a man who understood a ministry of repentance. He preached repentance. He gets thrown in jail for it. He tells Herod, your wife is illegitimate. You married your brother's wife because you divorced your first wife. You need to repent. And he gets his head cut off. And the disciples are sitting there thinking, man, this ministry of repentance is great. Look at all the authority we have. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't get it. You haven't got it yet. When you're called to a ministry of repentance, it's going to cost you everything. And the contrast between John the Baptist and the disciples' misunderstanding couldn't, couldn't be sharper in Mark chapter 6. So the reason I give you those two examples is now we find ourselves in Mark chapter 5 with another Mark and Sandwich. And if we're going to eat the sandwich properly, if we're going to benefit from the story, we need to make sure that we understand the comparison. There's a comparison between... What happens in the outside story and the inner story. And there are a few things that are parallel and there are a few things that are contrasts. And so I'm going to work through the story in a pretty quick fashion. And then I'll just try to draw some conclusions at the end before we look at some of the implications of this story. But I wanted to prep you so that as we work through the story, you can know why it's important and how how you need to read the story. Mark's comparison is important. We need to look at both of these stories in tandem because that's how he tells his story. So let's pick it up in verse 21. And the title for this this whole sermon is Responding to Jesus' Power and Authority. We're seeing his power and authority on display as we've seen in the previous two narratives. If we go all the way back to 435, Jesus' power over disaster, power over natural disaster, over nature itself. The beginning of chapter 5, power over demons. And then now, disease, and even death. So those are four Ds, if you want. Um, Disaster, demons, disease, 
and death. And notice the response in these stories to Jesus' authority and his power. Verse 21, Jesus crossed over again in the boat to the other side. Now, real quick, you'll remember if you've been a part of the Mark series, last week we looked at verses 1 through 20, and when Jesus cast out the demon out of the demoniac, and, and they said their name was Legion, That happened on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And you remember that what happened was such a display of power that in verse, go back real quick to chapter 5, verse 15, that when the people of the towns came to this area of the seashore uh, next to the caves and the tombs up on the mountain where this man dwelt, they saw him sitting down clothed in his right mind and they became terribly frightened. And then when they heard the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' authority over these demons, and they saw that they had no excuse for living under the power of Satan themselves, and they saw a superior power coming from Jesus Christ himself, they realized there's something here that's more terrifying than a demon-possessed man who could hurt us. They are terrified of Jesus' authority and his power, his ability and his right to rule and to reign. And so in verse 17, they began to beg him to leave their region. They are like, please get out of here. They were more comfortable with a demon-possessed man who could maul them on on their trip up the seashore than they than they, they were here by Jesus Christ in their presence. And so Jesus jumps in the boat, verse 21, and he crosses back over to the other side. He leaves them, one evangelist, the former demoniac, to go tell everyone in the Decapolis, the ten cities on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, what great things God has done for him and how he's had mercy on him. So, verse 21, they cross over, and now they're going back to the west side where several of the stories in this gospel have already taken place. And they get to the other side. A large crowd gathers around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. In other words, the picture that you're clearly to have in your mind is it's the boat landing on the seashore, and he's just getting out of the boat, and instant crowd. He can't even get away from the seashore before he's just absolutely assaulted with the, the public demand. And he's completely enveloped in this massive crowd. Verse 22, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up. Now, obviously a a synagogue official, he's obviously a dignified man. He's noble. He's known. He's named um, prominent. The name Jairus is already a name that has occurred in the Old Testament. Uh, At least the root of the word in Hebrew would mean he enlightens, speaking usually of God. God enlightens. Um, uh, Jair is a typical uh, uh, rabbinical name. And so this uh, Jewish man named Jairus comes up to him and on seeing him fell at his feet. He's already in a position of worship. He's in a position of respect. He's in a position of, of honor, paying homage to Christ. And he's appealing to Jesus on the basis, basis of his identity and on the basis of his authority. And he says in verse 23, he implored him earnestly. It just means he begged him with intensity, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Literally in the, in the Greek, it's, she's at the end, she's terminal. We don't necessarily know, he doesn't say anything about how he knows that. But of course, you, know, you in the medical profession know there are certain indicators, certain things that would happen in, a, in, a, in, a, in the process of dying of, as a disease would take over or as um, dementia would take over and abilities are lost. And you sometimes you might say, oh, okay, well, yeah, you got, maybe you got four to ten days or two to four hours. He's sitting here saying to Jesus, she's terminal. It's at the end. We're there. She's at death's door. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Jesus, he being Jesus in 24, he went off with him. And a large cloud was following him and pressing in on him. Now that detail is not a throwaway detail. That's actually preparing us for the inside story, the inner story. Uh, When we get to the next story of this woman who is hemorrhaging, 
He's already on a mission. He already has a need. There is a daughter of a synagogue official who is on death's door. She does not have long to live. And this crowd is still with him. And so they're just jostling, just, you know, baby steps because you can't even stride to get to Jairus' house because there's so many people around and everybody's bumping up against him. And so that's not a throwaway statement. That actually plays into this next story, verse 25. This is where this inside story starts. Mark introduces a woman, another woman. In verse 25 and 26, they might not look that special in, in, in your translation. They're actually pretty unique in the original. It's, very, it's not typical at all for Mark to just launch into two entire verses without a verb. He just starts lining up participle after participle after participle, describing this woman, preparing us for the action sequence, which begins in verse 27. And what it does is it evokes some incredible pity and compassion on this woman when you read her plight in verses 25 and 26. Notice what he says. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's been living with this affliction. It doesn't say the cause, and um, that's not even important. In modern day terms, you might say, oh, it could be it could be a, a, a problem of the blood, blacking platelets. It could be an endometriosis. It could be, and there's all sorts of about a dozen medical diagnoses that you would start to work through to try to figure out what is the, the problem and, and then what's the cure and how do we solve it? And she knows that world well. Look at verse 26. She had endured much at the hands of many physicians. Now, this isn't an insult to the medical profession. Well, maybe it is if they were just to happen to be negligent. But this is more a theological commentary on the fact that, yes, we have physicians. And skilled physicians are an incredible service to a community uh, when they are skilled and knowledgeable. But nevertheless, we still live in a cursed world, and medicine does not have all the answers. God has cursed this world beyond medicine's ability to ever solve. This woman had endured much at the hands of many physicians. And she had spent all that she had. She poured out all of her resources. The idea here being all of her stuff. I mean, literally, it's like not only just, not that she just broke. She's probably been selling things. She's living at a poverty level, desperate to find relief, desperate to find a cure, some sort of solution. And so if she's, if she's broke, then she'll sell more to try to find the right service. And so she has endured much. And then Mark even records, and she was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. She spent all of these resources trying to overcome the curse that's afflicting her in her life. And she's actually worse off for it after spending and pouring out all of those resources. It's important to be aware of what this would have meant for this woman. I mean, again, we're back on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And so this Jewish woman would have known not a single day of ceremonial cleanliness in 12 years. This is different. I mean, you who have suffered from chronic sickness and chronic pain and chronic disease, you can, you can identify in many ways with this woman, but there is an element, a social element that's even more stigmatizing than the disease itself. And that's her perpetual state of being unclean. Listen to Leviticus 15. I'm going to jump in at verse 25. Now, if a woman has a discharge of her blood, many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity, she is unclean. Verse 27 says, likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until 
evening. And when she becomes clean from her discharge, she shall count off for herself seven days, and afterwards she will be clean. And then on the eighth day, she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them into the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer one for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on her behalf before the Lord because of her impure discharge. So for 12 years, She's been waiting for the discharge to end so that she can start counting off seven days and on the eighth day, finally get back to fellowship with the people of God. Finally, maybe partake of one feast, one celebration. Otherwise, she has to remain in isolation in a perpetual state of uncleanliness. She hasn't been clean for 12 years. Verse 27 Back in Mark 5, sorry. Mark chapter 5, verse 27. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. An unclean woman. Any physical contact, according to Leviticus 15, would make one unclean. And she sneaks up behind him in the crowd, grabs his garment, his his robe, tunic, whatever it was. Verse 28 just explains what she was thinking. For she was thinking, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. And this is an incredible, this is an incredible act of faith. Think about the faith involved in this moment. I mean, the social, socially, she's not even supposed to be there. And this is the most well-known teacher on the face of the earth at that time. She's ceremonially unclean. If she touches him, then apart from something miraculous like this happening, he would become unclean. And she just wiggles her way in, blows off all social etiquette, being unclean in the process of doing this because she's convinced uh, I'll get healed. Verse 29, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. And then the NAS says, and she felt, and literally the original says she knew, and she knew in her body that she was healed of her affliction like that. 12 years, 12 years of suffering, 12 years of being ceremonially unclean. And in a moment she knows in her body, it's all back to normal according to God's design. Verse 30, immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Now, I kind of read that a little bit, you know, pretty strong. We don't, we don't, we don't have verbal, you know, non, non you know, the body language, the, the tone, the speed, the intensity. But he's asking a question here, who touched my garments? And the, the disciples' response is, pretty easy to read between the lines, the tone that they had, because they're asking a question that they are convinced is just, should be dripping with irony. You see the crowd pressing in on you and you're going to ask who touched you. Are you kidding me? I mean, like I, I, I almost imagine that's it's not, I can't prove it, but I almost imagine them kind of like to Jesus. There are, what are you doing? Are you kidding me? Hundreds of people. Crowding around you, jostling up against you, and you're, who touched you? Of course, they misunderstand the whole thing. He, doesn't, he just ignores it. <laughs> He's so gracious. <laughs> so I can imagine him just going. So he keeps looking. <laughs> he looked around to see the woman who had done this. And then it's interesting that Mark even records it's just a feminine, feminine article pronoun here that uh, shows it indicates that uh, he's looking for the woman who had done this. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating that uh, Jesus knew power had proceeded out of him. She knew in her body, she had been healed. And this is not a question, obviously, this is not a question of, hey, somebody bumped me. Whatever the disciples were imagining. Hey, somebody bumped me. Yeah, yeah, a thousand people bumped you. What are you talking about? He's looking for 
who it was who had such profound faith. Verse 33, but the woman fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her. And the, 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 the word aware is it's probably a causal participle. You could even say because she was aware of what had happened to her, she might have been imagining, I, I know I'll get healed if I touch his garment. I think I can pull this off. Just hiding in the crowd, sneaking up behind him, and just touching the, and just getting out of there. It's like a little, uh, you know, guerrilla warfare move. You just, you come in and just get out, and nobody even knows, and he just like stops traffic and is ignoring these ridiculous questions, and he's just like dead set on finding who this was who had this, inc- this incredible type of faith. And she's just like, oh, I'm not getting away with it. Oh, no. It's a pretty profound combination of what we see in this woman because we see this profound faith coupled with fear and trembling. It's coupled with this fear and trembling. I mean, she's probably a pretty young believer. And all of a sudden, her estimation and expectation that she could pull this thing off without ever being caught is exposed. And oh no, now it's just, now it's going to be public. And so, verse 33, she comes up, she fell down before him. Again, you keep noticing these parallels, Jairus falling down. Now she falls down before him and told him the whole truth. And so she, no doubt, recounts the whole story. That was 12 years ago. I mean, obviously, that information had to come out at some point for Peter to have told that to Mark. And so she's probably telling them the whole story. Here's what I've suffered for 12 years. Here's what it's cost me. And this is, the, this is what it's meant for me to even be a part of the people of God. And this is what it's meant for me to be ostracized, to never even be able to worship in the temple. I can't even go up to any one of the three major feasts, any. I haven't been there since 12 years ago. And I was thinking, Jesus, I was just thinking if I could just touch your garment. It just spills it all. And Jesus responds to her in verse 34, daughter, Now, we could debate and wrangle about Greek words, the word sozo, which has been translated deliver. Does that mean saved? Well, if you're delivered from a physical ailment, then of course you're delivered from that ailment. Does it mean saved spiritually? It could mean, it can mean, you can be used in both contexts. And in this case, she's obviously delivered from a physical malady. But when Jesus uses the word daughter, there's something very endearing about it. There's something very parallel to Jairus talking about his daughter. And then he says, your faith has made you well. And we could, we could, if that was all he said, we could maybe have a legitimate debate. Is it just a physical healing? But notice what he says next. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. He wishes her peace And this isn't just, you know, casual, colloquial greeting, you know, peace out. Hey, peace. (laughs) This is theological peace. This is an important word. Jesus Christ, the son of God, offering peace to this woman. Let me just pause real quick. I know we're, I know we got to keep making some pace through this, this pretty incredible story, but I'm going to put a pause on the story for a moment because I I don't want to wait till the end to bring out the importance of why he says peace to you at this particular point. Let me just read to you a few passages about peace. The word shalom is obviously very common. It kind of comes over from the Hebrew, even into English. And so you've heard, probably heard the word shalom, which just means peace. Let me read to you a few examples from the scriptures about peace. I'm going to, the first one comes from Leviticus, not, not the first in the Bible, just the first one I want to read to you. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 6, Moses writes this, I will also grant peace in the land. These are the blessings uh, that God's going to give when, when the nation is consecrated to the Lord. I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land with no sword to, and no sword will pass through your land. So this means that there's no hostile enemy on your boundaries. It means that there's no wild animals running through the nation, killing people. And it means that there's no skirmishes, military murder or battles happening inside the nation. That's peace. That is a result, 
of a nation that is consecrated to Yahweh, obeying and fulfilling the, the stipulations of the conditions of the covenant. That's peace. Now, listen to Numbers chapter 6, verse 26. This is that famous benediction. Um, that the priests, the, the priests used in the Levitical system. And in Numbers 6, verse 26, it says, The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So already, we've only gotten two verses in, and we could look at hundreds. We obviously won't this morning, but we could look at hundreds of examples of the word peace in the Old Testament, and you would see uh, military peace. You would see rest from disease. You would see rest from enemies, rest from the curse and onslaught and famine and blight. You'd see rest from all of these things. But rest essentially is God lifting up his countenance on you. It's God's favor on you. It's peace with God formerly offended. And when the entire nation knows God in that way, the whole nation is going to know peace. In fact, it's also interesting to think about false peace. And I'm only going to just read a couple of examples of this. The battle for truth that was happening in the Old Testament was a proclamation of peace. The true prophets of Israel are saying, here's what peace looks like. You need to repent and obey the Yahweh. And the false prophets are saying, peace, peace. And the true prophets had to say, there is no peace. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 6. In Jeremiah 6, you have a, a Jeremiah talking about the false prophets who are, who are bringing that message They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And the false prophets, they they could appeal to all sorts of things. They might look at a a season of Israel's history where the military was strong or uh, economics were prospering. They might look at a season where the nation was doing quite well, and they might say, see, there's peace. And a prophet like Jeremiah is saying, no, 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 they've healed these people superficially because their problem is first and foremost guilt before God. There is no peace horizontally if there's no peace vertically. That's all that matters. And that was the message of all the the true prophets in the Old Testament, calling the nation to repent so that there could be a divine peace, so that God would lift up his countenance and look upon them with favor, and that Yahweh would reign over Israel and bring true peace through his overpowering presence. So now go back to Mark chapter five. In our story, Jesus heals this woman and says, your faith has saved you. And by the way, I will tip my hat to the meaning of that phrase. You actually cannot find an example of that phrase being used of a physical healing where they're not also a believer. There are plenty of unbelievers who are healed in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. One quick example would be the 10 lepers who are healed. One comes back to worship Christ and he says, go, your faith has made you well. Singular. All 10 were healed. He says to this woman, your faith has saved you. And then he says, peace, go in peace, be healed of your affliction. There's favor with this woman between her and God. There's peace between her and God formerly offended, formerly sinned against. While he was still speaking, he's in the middle of that sentence we just read in verse 34. He's at mid-sentence while he's speaking that this group, just an unnamed group, they came from a house, the house of the synagogue official. So now we're back to the story within a story. This is the outer story, the story of Jairus. People come from his household and they're saying, so now they're, they're talking to Jairus behind the public conversation happening between Jesus and this woman. So imagine the majority of the crowd listening to Peter, I mean, sorry, Jesus talk to this woman and the disciples standing around, but then all of a sudden there's this back alley conversation taking place just off the scene. And they're whispering to Jairus or they're telling him while Jesus is having this public conversation, look, your daughter died, so don't trouble the teacher anymore. That's a, that's a gut-wrenching sentence for Jairus. Just think about this for a second. 
Jairus is a man of faith. He believes Jesus can heal his daughter and he is urgently seeking Christ because she is at death's door. She's only got a few matter of hours. He gets a hold of him, starts to fight the crowd to get him to his house and gets stopped on the way in this altercation. And that was all the time that he had. And his daughter died in the middle of this conversation, in this exchange with this woman who shouldn't even have been there, ceremonially unclean. And they say, it's too late. Don't bother him anymore. I mean, there's no need to speculate what he might have been thinking, but it could be edifying to even think of the responses to Christ at this point, uh, not to Christ, but to that news. He could have been thinking, sure, she became your daughter. What about mine? He could have been thinking all sorts of carnal things. We don't know, but that's the situation that Jairus is in. He's in a hopeless situation. He trusted Christ could heal his daughter, and now it's too late. Verse 36, but Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, (laughs) just great. Like he's having a conversation with the woman. He's just like processing what's happening in this private conversation uh, off to the, you know, stage left. And he's just taking it all in, finishes the conversation with the woman, and then turns. He says to the synagogue official, he says to Jairus, hey, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only believe. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty strong statement. When your daughter just died, you hear from your, hear from the people that you employ. It's too late to hear Jesus say, don't be afraid. Believe. Verse 37, he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the three. And so the inner circle of his disciples go with him. They came to the house of the synagogue official, verse 38, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And that's typical. That would be typical of of the day. You would mourn this way. Um, In fact, in verse um, 39, he enters in and Jesus says to them, why you make a commotion and weep? So they're actually, they're putting on a show. It's just like, it's a professional morning crew. Uh, it's interesting in the Mishnah, uh, Rabbi Judah is recorded as saying that even the poorest man in Israel should not hire fewer than two flutes and one professional wailing woman. And so, you know, I don't know how that would go. I don't know if there's like a resume for that, like what kind of octaves you're able to hit when you're mourning. And you just, you know, if you really love the deceased, you you get the best of the best of the professional mourners. But it's just fascinating. They're sitting here mourning and he comes in and makes a statement and they just start laughing at him. Obviously, the mourning is not legitimate. They're just, they're just paid professionals doing, putting on the show, putting on the act. They're not really mourning. They're able to laugh like in a nanosecond. (laughs) Yeah, right. Okay, whatever. Anyway, we're going to keep, keep doing our job. And obviously, it probably was a, quite a big ruckus because if the poorest in Israel would do two, two, two flutes and a wailing woman, well, then Jairus probably had a lot. And so in verse 39, he says to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. Okay, why did he say that? Why did he say she's asleep? Is, he, uh, is she still alive, but just snoozing? <laughs> she's in REM? No, of course not. I mean, these people are... I mean, they, they, she's been dead long enough to go hire the professional mourners and they're already there doing their job. They've also already had enough time to send, a, to send a, some delegates over to Jesus to tell him, hey, time's up, it's already happened. The moment's already passed. It's actually been quite a bit of time and they are not unaccustomed to death. They know what death looks like. Jesus is not saying she's not um, literally dead. She's just sleeping. Just let her, just let her wake up and let her, let her snooze go off. I mean, let her alarm clock ring. He's not saying that he's using sleep in the new Testament use of sleep 
Death for the believer is temporary. Death for the believer is temporary. And so that's why in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's talk, it talks of death for the believer as going to sleep. Going to sleep. Because there's no spiritual death for the believer. And in this case, this girl is only going to be asleep temporarily. She's only dead temporarily. And so he is using the word sleep in its typical in its typical way, theological way that it's used in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Thess of believers who die. Verse 40, they began laughing at him. So they're laughing at him. He kicks them out. <laughs> Putting them all out, he took the child's father and mother and his own companions. So it's just the six of them. And they go into the room where the child was and notice this, taking the child by the hand. This is a corpse. This is a corpse. I mean, according to Leviticus and Numbers, that would make you unclean to touch a corpse. He says to her, Talitha kum, which is Aramaic, and translated as, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk. First, she was 12 years old. Now, that's an interesting relationship. For she was 12. Is that, explaining, is that explaining why she walked? As in, as if, as if to say she's not six months old, so she was at the walking age? I, I think it's just Mark pointing out another parallel between these two stories of the woman who'd been dying for 12 years and this, woman, this girl who died who was living for 12 years. And immediately they were completely astounded. This girl physically died. Jesus didn't miss the deadline at all. He walks into our room and shows a superior power and authority over death. Verse 43, he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. Of course, he continues trying to keep the miraculous elements of his ministry secret because it's gathering a so much notoriety and so many curiosity seekers are uh, filling up the details of his day that he can't even get, get be focused on preaching. And that's just continues as you see in verse 43. But this is a profound story within a story. Think about this in verse 34, God gains a daughter in verse 35, Jairus loses a daughter in verse 38. The mourners weep and wail at death, in verse 39, the mourners laugh at Jesus. In verse 40, Jesus laughs at the mourners and laughs at death. What I want to do is I'm going to just summarize some of the comparisons and contrasts here in rapid fire fashion. Let me just list some out for you. Here's a comparison by way of contrast. Things about the, the story of Jairus versus the story of this unnamed woman who was hemorrhaging, stories, uh, the elements in this story that are different. Where are the contrasts? Here are some of the contrasts. On the one, you've got a man. On the other, you've got a woman. On the, on the one, you've got a, a guy who's wealthy and noble. On the other, poor and common. On the one, it's somebody who's named, who's known, Jairus. In the other, she's unnamed. We don't even know her name. In one, he sees Jesus. In the other, she hears of Jesus. In one, he has a face-to-face -face with Jesus. In the other one, she's hiding from Jesus in verse 27. In one, you have fear prohibited. Do not be afraid. In the other, you have fear exhibited. Fearing and trembling because she was aware of what happened. She came and fell down and told him the whole truth. In one, you have faith Exhorted, verse 36, only believe. In verse 34, you have faith exhibited. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. In one, Jesus touches her, verse 41. In the other, she touches Jesus, verse 27. I'm going to continue the comparison by way of parallel. There's several elements of these stories that are parallel. Listen to this. The 12-year detail is the same for both. 
And Jairus' daughter was 12 years old when she died. She began to live 12 years prior. In the unnamed woman, in her life, her, she, she's experienced 12 years of suffering. Her, she began dying 12 years ago in the sense of experiencing the effects of this disease. In both, it's a hopeless situation. Verse 23, my little daughter is at the point of death. She's at the end. She's terminal. In verses 25 and 26, uh, the unnamed woman, it's just a hopeless situation. The length of her suffering, the inability of her doctors, uh, the, her physical demise getting worse. Impurity would come from touching a corpse, Numbers 19, verses 11 to 13. Impurity would come from touching an unclean woman, as we read in Leviticus 15. One falls before Jesus, Jairus falls before Jesus in verse 22, and the hemorrhaging woman falls before Jesus in verse 33. Healing is sought, verse 23, and once again, verse 28. Life is regained in verse 42, and also in 29 and 34, because of the healing or the resurrection from the dead. And both have a misunderstanding by witnesses. In verse 40, the mourners completely misunderstand Jesus. And in 31, the disciples misunderstand Jesus. There's a contrast and a comparison between these two stories. And the temptation to fear is very real. But so is a very real presence of faith. The response to Jesus' power and authority, as we have seen in all of these stories, going back to chapter 4, verse 35, is a question mark to the reader. Are you going to be afraid? Or are you going to believe? The disciples see Jesus' power to calm the sea, and they began to be terribly frightened, exceedingly frightened. Who is this who has authority over nature? The locals who see the demoniac are terrified and ask him to get out of here. We don't want you here anymore. And the disciples are struggling. The Gentiles are struggling. And here's two individuals. One man with money, noble, known, another unknown, woman, unclean, no resources, both faithful, both tempted to fear. When you understand where we're at, as Mark continues to document, document the identity of Jesus, you realize that the issue is, do you believe? Some of these responses to Jesus are showing an uh, A weakness of faith because of the presence of fear. And some are showing an absence of faith because they are consumed by fear. Fears will absolutely prevent your following after Christ. You cannot be a disciple of Christ. You won't be a successful disciple of Christ if you are plagued by self-oriented, self-protecting fear. Faith is the only answer to the fears that will cause you to compromise in your following after Jesus Christ. Fears will thwart your discipleship. Here, Jesus is on the way, he's on the path to Jerusalem, and the question is, who's going to follow him? The question's still out on the disciples. They got a long road ahead of them, and they got a lot of tests to learn, and we're going to benefit from those tests, particularly after they become the focal point, and Jesus is going to teach them some critical tests about their faith and their fear in chapters 8 through 10. But for now, what I want to do is I just want to ask you some questions. Questions that I think are going to be helpful for you to identify sinful fear. Sinful fear that would prevent you from following Christ on the path. Fears that would cause you to be a compromiser in your discipleship and in your pursuit of Christ. Ask yourself a few questions. Number one, what about following Christ causes you anxiety? What is it about following Christ that causes you anxiety or concern? Anything that's going to cause you concern or anxiety is certainly an area that's going to touch on some fears that need to be dealt with. And they need to be answered with with, with robust faith. Secondly, where are you pleasing yourself rather than God? Where are you pleasing yourself rather than God? Anytime that you are driven by a fear to the point that you would actually please yourself and not God, there's, there's some sort of fear associated with what, what obedience would actually look like. And ask yourself, where are you 
pleasing yourself? Where are you doing your own will rather than the will of God? Third, what about your current circumstance is difficult to trust him with? What about your current circumstance is difficult to trust him with? It's just pretty compelling to think about Jesus' statement to Jairus. Don't fear. Only believe. Fourth, what commands are you not obeying? What commands are you not obeying? You have commands to rejoice, to be content, to have, show gratitude. What commands are you not obeying? Those questions might start a process where you're able to go to God's word and start to see fear exposed because those fears are going to prevent you from following Christ. Those fears will lead to greater and greater compromises. Let me give you a few examples. One fear that we're going to see in the gospel of Mark is the fear of exposure, the fear of exposure, the fear of conviction, the fear of having to admit that I'm wrong. Fear of exposure or the fear of having to admit that I'm wrong is a, is a fear that's consistent with insecurity. If we're spiritually insecure, then we're not confident that we've done all that we could have or all that we should have, and we're stubbornly resistant to having to admit failure. Insecurity can arise from fears that might mean that I might be shown a better path. If I follow Christ and if I look at God's word, honestly, I might realize, oh, I made some major mistake. And as a parent, how, how challenging is that? If you've been parenting a certain way and you realize, oh man, what have I been doing all these years? I have to admit, oh, that wasn't the, the most faithful. That wasn't, I had blind spots because of sin. And oh man, I gotta, I gotta make that right. If there's fear of exposure, it's gonna prevent you from following Christ. Or learning truths that you didn't know would mean that you have to admit that you were ignorant. Or worse, seeing the implications of known truths would mean you'd have to admit that you were stubborn. Faith, on the other hand, faith overcomes such insecurities because faith knows it's worth it. It's worth it to self-indict. Humility is worth it. True humility is the only state in which God can dwell comfortably in your heart. It embraces fellowship with God and realizes it's more valuable to have fellowship with God than any circumstance that I might possibly imagine would satisfy me. Isaiah 57 verse 15 and 66 verse 2 both highlight that God loves to dwell with the broken and the contrite. We need to have faith to overcome this fear of exposure, this fear of, it's an insecurity, it's a fear of indictment, it's a fear of having to admit that we're wrong. Another fear is the fear of loss. We might fear that if we follow Christ, we might lose something. We might lose relationships. We might lose resources. We might lose prominence or prestige. And it's true. You might lose a lot. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. We're called to follow him. We're called to renounce our right to everything in this life. Faith trusts in him who has the right and the power to do whatever he pleases with us. Faith rejoices that God would take anything from me that would diminish his glory in any way. But fear would say, I don't want to give it up. And the greatest fear might be death, but in this story, the faith of Jairus is compelling him to pursue Jesus in order to save his daughter. But in the intervening process of healing, it became too late for his own daughter to be healed. And sometimes the, the, the feeling of Jairus, the sense that Jairus is experiencing back in verse, between verse 35 and verse 36, if we read between the lines, just imagine what he was feeling in that moment. I, I know this guy can save my daughter. It's too late. In that moment, that's, that's the test right there of faith. We might think we trust the Lord for something. We, we, we are convinced would bring him glory. He never gives it. And then we lose access to that little thing and we have to just let it die. And faith says, I know the Lord knows what's best. Fear of suffering. Paul says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Jesus tells his own disciples that three times in Mark 8, 31, in Mark 9, 30 to 32, and then in 10, 32 to 34. And it says that after the third prediction of his death, 
his sufferings and his resurrection, they are scared to follow him on the path of Jerusalem. And they start following a little farther back on the road. They're just like getting a little bit more distance. But Bartimaeus is a disciple who follows Jesus with faith, jumps on the path, starts following him to Jerusalem because he sees clearly. Uh, We need faith in Christ who has power over disaster, demons, disease, and death. How about fear of the unknown, fear of the future? We even saw this last week with the demoniac. His greatest desire, I just want to be with Jesus. Jesus says, nope, you're staying here by yourself. Go preach the gospel. Fear at that point would say, ah, no, I don't, I'm scared of what that would mean. I don't want to do that. Faith says, absolutely. To serve you, however you've called me to serve. What a privilege. What a privilege. Faith kills the fear of the unknown, the fear of the future, because faith believes that God is who he claims to be. Faith takes Jesus at his word. Faith believes and knows, and it becomes conviction that he's sovereign. He knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for his father's glory. Faith believes this as a conviction, and it conquers every potential fear that would derail us in our pursuit of Jesus Christ. Whatever, think about this. Whatever I might be scared about in the future is is silly. Either it won't come true or it will. Those are your two options. You have a fear about something in the future, some unknown. It's either going to come true or it's not. Those are your two options. If it doesn't come true, well then what a waste of time. And if it does come true, This is where faith comes in. Do I believe that God knows best? Do I trust Jesus Christ? Do I trust him? If I am afraid about something unknown, then obviously this is the fruit of pride. And it's, it's, it's time, brothers and sisters, it's time that we examine, just keep examining our life and make sure that we stay on the path of discipleship by faith. Don't fear, only believe. Lord, we want to just come before you this morning and we want to just acknowledge like the woman with the hemorrhage, we believe, but we are still trembling and fearful at times. Like the father in Mark 9, we believe, but help our unbelief. Lord, I pray that wherever... Sinful fear would be robbing any of your children in this room, in this church, robbing them of joy, robbing them of a vibrant relationship with you, robbing them of robust fellowship, contentment. That it would, that it would be answered with a robust faith. I pray that to begin with, Lord, we would just be able to confess right now corporately as your church. We want to confess and renounce all sinful fear. Lord, wherever we've been afraid of discipleship that requires everything, wherever we've been afraid to take up our own cross, and wherever we've been afraid to renounce our grip on this life, Lord, we, we, we gladly acknowledge that as, as sheer pride. It's unbelief. It's worldliness. It's natural earthly, demonic. It's wisdom from below. Lord, that thinking must go. We come before you broken. We come before you with hands empty. We have nothing to offer but the liability and the guilt of that kind of thinking. And Lord, we pray, increase our faith. Grant faith and then test faith. And as you test faith, give us the joy that comes from seeing a real, legitimate, supernatural, God-given faith proven in the furnace of affliction. And when it holds in a, in, in a situation that we know that we don't have the ability to mimic or emulate or manufacture on our own, we will cry out in worship and thank you for testing a faith that was able to overcome such fear. And so Lord, thank you for the examples. Thank you for the powerful story of, of Jairus and of this woman. And thank you for showing us
their faith and exposing even in us some fear. We pray that you'd glorify your name through us. And as we sing this song, Lord, I do pray that this song would be a continued expression of prayer, a corporate expression of prayer, that this would be our prayer this morning in response to this text. In your name we pray. Amen.